heavenly Turn on music loud Lift my voice and shout
Well, let's all come on in and get ready for our 9 a.m. service. Glad you guys uh, could make it here this morning. Uh, apparently, the wind is going to be just a little uh, less windy today, so I won't keep you guys too long. Uh, maybe I'll be long-winded, uh, but we'll get you out to the sun soon enough. But let's all stand right now, and let's prepare to get into the presence of the Lord. I always need to examine my motives, um, always, uh, especially at church services, and and uh, ask uh, myself why I'm here, uh, what I intend to receive while being here, and, and uh, why I think I'm even allowed to be here. And uh, all of it stems from uh, God's goodness and God's grace. Uh, God invited us here. Uh, he wants us to be in His presence because in His presence is fullness of what? Joy. In His presence is fullness of joy. He says, come hang out with me because I want to bless you. Some of you came here thinking, I need to go to church and bless the Lord. I got to do it. It's what I got to do. Listen. <laughs> That's not, what, that's, that's not what God says. He says, no, no, no. I start it out. I give you the bear hug first and you respond. And uh, so let's, let's set our eyes to the Lord. I'm going to read Psalm 121 before we sing. It says, I will lift my eyes to the hills. Uh, from whence comes my help? That's a question. Here's the answer. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. He says, the Lord is your keeper. He's your shade. It's your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. And the Lord shall preserve you from all evil. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth uh, even forevermore. So let's set our attention on the Lord and ask him uh, to be the one that does the blessing this morning. <clears throat> Father, we in Jesus' name come to you now uh, obediently. Uh, expectantly, hopefully not religiously, but we do come, Lord, and we want to uh, let you examine our motives this morning, and we ask, God, that your grace uh, would be profound, that your grace, Lord, would change everything, that your grace would be uh, the new high watermark in our theology and what we believe to be the most important thing uh, about us is our understanding of Jesus. Uh, so bless this time. We thank you for songs and singing. Help us to meditate on the words. Some of these songs will be new to uh, visitors and, and others. And we just pray that we would have our hearts soft to receive from you. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you just heal us. Heal, heal hearts. Uh, heal bodies. Uh, heal marriages and relationships. Uh, heal uh, all the things, Lord, that have gone crazy in this world. And we just show up now expectantly. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's sing to the Lord and worship him this morning. <laughs> Water you turned into wine Open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you And none like you Into the darkness Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we
is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but I only trust in Jesus' name. scripture but um that the praises that god is enthroned on high by the praises of his people is that right it's in the bible <laughs> it's true we lift we lift him up because he's made us to do that we're, we're we're made by him and uh so it's really all about him anyway but we get to enjoy it so let's take about a five minute break and uh we'll get back into the word the true word men's bathroom has been moved to outside there is an outside uh, porta potty by the way
Well, let's, let's come on in and grab a chair and uh, get into the text this morning, John chapter 10. And uh, we'll uh, get underway just after a few announcements. Um, busy week here at the church. Uh, right off the bat today is Gideon uh, week here at the church. Everyone reach in your front uh, pocket at the church or the seat in front of you and grab this thing out and show them you got one. This is a little information on the Gideon International. How many guys ever been to a hotel and seen a Gideon Bible there? How many guys ever, all of us, how many ever been on a college campus or a, a school campus and got a little Gideon New Testament handed to you? They got camouflage, orange, green, brown. They got all the colors. And uh, anyways, this is uh, your opportunity to read up on that. If you're ever going to give your money to a good organization that's going to make sure that the Word of God gets uh, put out, I think that's a good place to do so. So maybe give a, a check or a donation above and beyond your giving uh, to them. Here's a little insert that's in there. I'll read it to you. This little insert you can just take. Here's the high, high marks for Gideons. Uh, they distribute one million scriptures in 90 different languages in 200 countries every four and a half days. Uh, Uh, It says that they're flooding uh, the world and Lincoln County with God's word. If you're a businessman, a professional, uh, you could qualify to be a Gideon. So come and be our guest. Uh, Check this out. Uh, uh, At a dinner and a short presentation, the dinner's going to be at the Shiloh Inn uh, restaurant uh, Thursday, May 15th at 630. And you got to get a hold of Ray Hernandez. His information's there in order to let him know you're coming. So if you're kind of wondering what you should do, maybe you're not a part of a ministry right now and want to be a part of the Gideon International there's your opportunity right there, impact the world. Also, everyone reach in your front pocket and grab the other thing that's in there, this Get Connected card. I didn't mention this last week. Show me that you got one. Milton, you grabbed one. I saw you just reach out. Denise got one. Anybody got one? Dustin, you doing it? Come on, you guys. You guys, come on. I'm just kidding. Anyways, <laughs> this is a Get Connected card. Okay, these are brand new, hot off the press. And this is your way to get some direct feedback uh, to the staff here at the church, the pastoral staff, administrative pass, staff. Uh, Sunday school staff, etc. Let us know what's going on in your life. I got a couple of these turned in last week and it almost brought me to tears just reading what people are going through and what people are deciding to do with their life in Jesus. So what an awesome opportunity for you to uh, communicate with us in that way. So please uh, take note of that if you uh, need to. Like I said, it's a busy week. Uh, tomorrow night, the gals will be here at 6.30 uh, p.m. That's Monday night, April 14th. Tomorrow night, all the gals, women's ministry night, Sandy Shones. Uh, we'll be sharing out of Jeremiah 29, 11. Uh, kind of, again, just for that one moment in time, wish I was a gal so I could go. And uh, for all of the reasons, I'm glad I'm not a gal. No, I'm just kidding. I'm actually not kidding, but I had to say that. Anyways, gals, be here 6.30. Now check it out. If you're a dude, it's your night on Wednesday night. Wednesday night, all the dudes gather at 6.30 p.m. And then we got two more sessions, I do believe, before our six-week series is over. If you missed all four weeks up until this next Wednesday, who cares? Show up at 6.30 this Wednesday if you're a dude. And again, if you're a gal, show up tomorrow night. Then move it along to Friday, which is what? Someone tell me. It's Good Friday. Okay. Now that service starts at 6 p.m. Uh, Good Friday service will have communion, uh, worship, and the message reflecting upon Jesus and his crucifixion. Uh, as most of you biblical students and those in the know uh, understand, today's, uh, what day is today? Palm Sunday. Today would be the day that we would commemorate Jesus Christ riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, as was prophesied hundreds of years earlier. And everyone saw him in a twinkle of their eye and said, Hosanna, Hosanna, save now. And they they wanted what he had to offer. And then just a couple days later, they would say, crucify him. And we will remember that and reflect on that on on Good Friday at 6 p.m. So don't miss that. Uh, When you came in the door, maybe you got a little invitation that has the Good Friday um, poster printed on the back and the Easter one. That's for you to invite people uh, to church for our Passion Week services. So you all know that next week is what kind of Sunday? What's it called? Easter Sunday, and our services will be exactly the same, 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Here's the difference. We'll have on my left side a 600-gallon water trough, and on my right hand a 600-gallon water trough, one for first service, one for second service. We'll be doing water baptisms at both services. Both uh, tubs will be brought up to about 86 degrees, and this will be real real nice. And um, so you can plan on getting water baptized, invite somebody. I believe there'll be some uh, spontaneous water baptisms where people say, I'm doing it. I didn't plan on this today, but the Holy Spirit is saying, no, bro, you're going in, uh, and uh, it's going to be awesome. So plan on that. Be excited for that. And uh, also, don't forget uh, to keep praying for some of our families uh, in need. Uh, um, we've been praying for Jamel and Carlos uh, Viserreal and uh, their little baby, Mia Sophia, and she's just growing. From what I understand at this point, there's no, no complications. Is that right? Jamel's here. Jamel, will you stand? Will you sit down and just look at everyone? Clap for Jamel. Uh, Jamel's, uh, Jamel's been in Eugene uh, in hospitals and charity houses for uh, many months now. Her daughter was born, what, two pounds, nine ounces? Two pounds? One pound, nine ounces. Wow. 
one pound nine ounces that uh, can fit in your coffee cup. And, um, and uh, so uh, Mia Sophia is her name. She's supposed to be up there for about another month or so, and then she'll be home. Okay. Four to five weeks. We're still praying for her lungs, for everything to develop properly, for her to gain the weight she needs to and get to the birth weight she should have had. And uh, uh, James, or no, should I say, uh, Jamel and Carlos are getting their apartment ready for that. So if you want to continue to help us help them get into that apartment, that would be great. Also, more uh, recently, uh, I think it was Friday morning. Was it Thursday or Friday morning? Um, Jacob and Judd Pierce had their third baby. And no, many of you know Jacob and Judd Pierce. And they had home birth. And a uh, little Rosemary Jubilee came out and crying and being a little awesome little girl that she should be. And uh, the midwife said, you know what? There's something on her back I don't really like. And why don't you take her in real quick and have, her, have them check that out. So they went to the hospital. And the hospital here in Newport said, yeah, we don't really like that either. Why don't you take them? Uh, take her to OHSU, and so they are up in OHSU now. When the doctor up there saw this little spot on this little brand new newborn one-day-old baby, said, you know what, we're, we're not quite sure what's going on. 90% chance uh, we're going to have to go in there and uh, do some surgery in order that she doesn't get paralyzed through a spinal infection. And some other details I'm not aware of, I do know this. Pray for Jacob and Judd Pierce, that they would have strength and courage. They would have wisdom as they make these decisions. Pray for uh, Rosemary Jubilee, this little baby girl, that she would be completely healed. And uh, we just need to really come alongside this family. I offered uh, support uh, financially as they're going back and forth and all the rest. And Jacob said, you know what, we're, we're good so far. We'll let you know. And the mo most important thing to this family was their friends and uh, the support of the church uh, coming alongside them. So that's Jacob and Judah Pierce and their three little kids. So, um, man, we, we uh, pray for them. So uh, all that to say this, I will pray for those families in just a minute. But please open your Bibles to John 10. And uh, we're going to begin our study where we left off last week uh, in verse 17. And I'm going to read and then we'll pray and then I'll preach and we'll let the Lord bring his power in the way he sees fit. So the beginning of verse 17, it says, therefore, Jesus is speaking, my father loves me. <laughs> this is such a cool verse. Because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, his life. No one takes my life, Jesus says, but I lay it down of myself, and I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again, speaking of his death and resurrection. This command I have received from my father is what my father sent me to do, just so you know. He keeps going. Uh, verse 19, therefore there was a division again. I have that word again uh, memorized in my, my mind among the Jews because of these sayings. They're just, they're mad at Jesus. He just is too disruptive for them. He just said, I'm laying down my life. <laughs> and they're like, oh, we're so mad at you. I mean, just, does that just sound weird? Like, I'm going to sacrificially give everything I have. They're like, well, we don't like it because it messes with our whole system. Let's keep reading. I'll get into the teaching later. Uh, verse 20, and many of them said, he has a demon and he's mad. Why do you even listen to him? Others said, uh, these aren't the words of one who has a demon. And can a demon open the eyes of the blind? There's some straight logic right there. And he goes on, verse 22, new territory now. Now it was the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem. This is about two and a half months later. And it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch, and the Jews surrounded him. You can just kind of sense the tempo here. And they said to him, how long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, then tell us plainly. Jesus answered them. I wonder if he was frustrated or if he was laughing. He says, I told you. And you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life and they shall never perish and neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. Here's the answer to their question, by the way, verse 30. I and my father are one. Tell us plainly, are you the... That's his answer. Uh, let's pray. Father, I pray you to open up our eyes and our hearts now to understand your word and that you, Lord, would honor your word above all else. That's what you said uh, in, in scriptures, Lord, that you would take your word and it would not return void, but it would accomplish what you set it out to do. Uh, just as the sun, Lord, uh, melts the ice and hardens the clay, Lord, your word has two effects on our hearts. It either uh, draws us nearer to you or it causes, again, a division. And uh, we trust you, Lord, and we ask that today there would be transformation from your word and that you would uh, be glorified. I submit myself to you, Lord, 
uh, coming to you into your throne room of grace boldly in my time of need, trying to obtain mercy for the task at hand. Uh, so Jesus be glorified, we pray in your name. Amen. 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 You ever go uh, maybe to the bank to make a deposit? And maybe, let's say you had $1,000, you sold a guitar, sold your car, and, and somebody gave you, uh, you know, a, hundred, a bunch of $100 bills. Some of you are like, what's a $100 bill? Anyway, <laughs> you got a bunch of $100 bills, and you go to the bank, and they're counting it out, making sure it's all there. It's just called $1,000. And then there's that moment where they pull out that black pen, you know, the marking pen, to make sure that they're all authentic, make sure none are counterfeit. And all of a sudden, if you're like me, a thought goes through your mind, like, I honestly don't know where those bills came from, you know? And uh, I'm kind of hoping they're real. And man, if one of those aren't real, if it's not, if it is a counterfeit, what's going to happen? Is it my fault? Is it their fault? I just sold this guy my lawnmower for $20,000, you know, or whatever it is. And there's that moment where you're just, we've got to identify the counterfeits. And I've never been on the uh, bad uh, end of a uh, situation like that. They've always been authentic, et cetera. Uh, but you'll remember last week, we, we began chapter 10. And Jesus said, if anybody, anybody at all tries to get into the sheepfold, which is where God's people are, heaven, and God's kids. If anybody tries to get in any other way besides the door, he's a thief and a robber. He's a counterfeit. And then Jesus went on to clarify with one of the great seven I am statements saying, I am the door. Okay, if anybody tries to get into heaven without going through the door, me, if anybody has any other theory, any other philosophy, any other ways of thinking or ways of climbing the ladder into heaven, Jesus point blank said, that is a cult. That is a thief and a robber. It's a counterfeit not okay any other way he went on to say not only am i the door in and out but i'm the shepherd i'm the good shepherd the one that's going to oversee and watch what goes on like he is both and and jesus christ is drawing people to himself but he's also calling these men these people the audience around them us today uh, to what i would call a self-examination okay how do we get in What's our way? What's our hope? Am I, am I really hoping that when God sees me that I have my own set of keys and my own door that I've fabricated into heaven and it's called my good works outweigh my bad works? There are thousands of people with that philosophy. Well, I'm a good person. Well, compared to who? Compared to bad persons. Oh, okay. Well, that, well, that okay. I guess that makes sense. Let's just use bad persons and bad grammar as our standard and everyone gets in except the bad persons. I mean, that's how foolish it is. And every one of us feels like, well, at least I'm, at least, seriously, at least I'm not as bad as that guy. I mean, I've done that all week. Well, at least, I'm, at, least, at least I didn't do that. At least I didn't do that. At least I'm not doing that. At least I've never done that. You, we all think that. Again, I always bring the illustration. That's why we love the news so much, because we're rarely in it. You know what I'm saying? We, you watch the news, you're like, not in the headlines today. Good day. There, there, there have been those rare moments in my life I've been in the headlines, and we all understand, and, and so Jesus is helping these guys. He's drawing the line, and I uh, listened to a guy who taught this portion of Scripture, and he, he titled this message, uh, Salvation Self-Exam, and I like that title. So you could title this if you're taking notes. Uh, you could title it Self-Exam. You could title it Salvation Self-Exam, or my favorite title, which I came up with, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. That's, that was my favorite title, thanks to Ice Cube. And... Um, <laughs> And uh, anyways, uh, it reminded me, though, of uh, uh, a couple years ago, about seven years ago, I uh, went to a dermatologist in Medford, and I wanted to get a full body screen, make sure I didn't have any uh, precancerous growth, any of that stuff, and had a couple concerned areas, and the doctor looked at those areas and said, no big deal, and as she um, was doing the, the thing there, she's like, yeah, everything's good, all the moles are they're from the same family, the pattern's good, everything's just right here, we just, I, and there's nothing to worry about except for that, and she pointed at my foot. She said, I, I don't like that one. That one doesn't look right. It's different. It kind of doesn't belong to the family. And so what we're going to do is we're going to cut that thing off and send it to the lab and do a biopsy and see what happens. And I said, right on, cut it off, you know. And that's a cool process. They inject some stuff into your foot or wherever your body and make it rise up a little bit. It turns into like a mountain. You can't feel it anymore. Then they take this razor blade. It's literally just a men's shaver, she said. It's like, no big deal. We just, they're super cheap. Look, at they're flexible. I'm like, okay. That's pretty crazy, you know, and then they just kind of scoop it off and throw it in a little thing and, and uh, came back benign and all the rest, and, uh, and, uh, but it's a, a self-exam, and um, on Tuesday, more recently, I went to uh, uh, Corvallis and uh, saw another dermatologist and had another area I'm just kind of concerned about, and so when I sat there uh, with this dude, and he looked at it, and first thing he said, he looked at the spot on my knee, and he looked at it, and he said, for sure, it's not melanoma, for sure, because it's not a mole, 
that has turned weird. Okay, that's what melanoma is. And melanoma, by the way, one person every hour uh, dies of melanoma skin cancer. It's a bad one. And uh, the best way to attack and to treat melanoma skin cancer, listen, here's the best way, early detection. If you don't detect it early, it can go deep, it can go bad, it can go weird and all the rest. And, and uh, we'll talk about early detection in just a minute. That's where we're at in the text. And so uh, this doctor looked at me and he said, you know, I don't, I don't really know what that is, to be honest with you. It's an outside chance. It's this over here. But, you know, here's what we could do. Two options he gave me. Number one, we just watch it, see what happens. Uh, number two, we cut it off and send it in and have the boys check it out. And I said, I said, I've been watching this for five months now. I said, the whole watching it point has led me to see you here wearing this gown, sir. You know, we're, we're done watching it, you know. It's yours. Take it off, you know. So he, he did that whole thing. That's a real fun you know, process. Not really. And anyway, so I'll find out tomorrow. I'll let you guys know. Maybe I'll go back on Facebook and let everyone know how that's going. Uh, the point is, the title of the message is self-exam. Uh, Jesus said to examine yourself. Paul said to examine yourself, to be in the faith. Uh, it's very important that you examine your faith and make sure you are doing it right. Make sure you understand it right. Uh, the Bible says to not fear somebody who can hurt your body. What's that about? Who cares about that? The Bible says fear the one who can destroy your body and your what? Soul. Your soul. This is a serious deal. Now, again, chronologically, for you Bible students trying to get this and summarize what's really happening, Jesus is marching toward the cross. Today is indeed uh, Palm Sunday, and so we're a little bit ahead in our calendar, but really we're about two or three months away from where uh, Jesus would indeed die and be murdered uh, for his statements, and more than that, for your sin. Praise the Lord. He, he came to do what he came to do in order that when we self-examine and find something, we can say, uh, I need the blood. I need to apply the blood right there. I need Jesus Christ to save me uh, from what's going on. And I do not want to be a counterfeit. And uh, so that is what I want you to grasp onto uh, today as we examine ourselves to make sure that we are right where we need to be. So let's just study it through, and uh, we'll take it verse by verse. Again, we ended in verse 17 right around there. And I just want to draw some more out of it because we were hurried uh, last Sunday. And so Jesus says, Therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it uh, again. And uh, Jesus is referring again to his death and his resurrection in these statements. And he just got done saying, I'm the door and I'm the shepherd. And someone, a critical person, which I hope you do have a critical thinking mind. Jesus didn't ask you to check your door or your brain at the door. Um, and uh, some of you, you don't have choice, you understand. And uh, that's me. <laughs> Jesus didn't ask you. He said, no, think. So he's saying, I'm the door, I'm the shepherd. Really? Really? How are you the door and the shepherd? Like, that's pretty hardcore. And he says, oh, I'm going to lay my life down. And I'm going to take it up again. Like, I'm going to pay for the whole thing. I'm not just big talk. I'm big walk, too. And Jesus is saying that the Father has sent me to do this. Verse 17, again, my Father loves me because I lay my life down that I may take it again. And I would just simply make this application. How many of you guys want to please your earthly dad? You can, okay, maybe it's just me. My dad's back there. And uh, you just, you know, some of you didn't have a good earthly dad, and I understand that. And, but you can understand the picture. You just want to make dad happy. Let's go to the Father then. How many of you just want the Father to smile on you? I mean, that's just your deepest desire. Maybe you're failing. You think you're failing. Maybe you have failed. And you're just like, I just want to be at peace with him. Jesus gives us a little insight here. He says, the Father loves me because I'm laying down my life. Now, he's talking about the cross, but he's also talking about being a shepherd. He's talking about being a door. And if you want to join with me in the pursuit of making God happy, just continue to become a servant of all men. Okay. Get over yourself. Jesus is God. He could have easily just said, you know, I'm going to set up my throne right now. I'm kind of tired of this whole servant thing. And uh, it's kind of not working out for me. It might end up killing me. No. It, I need to do a little repenting even in my own heart and the way I serve my wife, the way I serve my kids, the way I serve my community, and the way I serve my church, especially if I want to make my father happy. Okay? Selfishness, greed, uh, self-thinking, self-serving, all of that stuff is opposite of who Jesus is. And Jesus here gives us a little insight. So if you're looking to please the Father, I believe it just is a lifestyle of denial. And uh, he goes on to say, uh, verse 18, uh, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. Uh, this command I have received from my Father. Jesus again saying, not only am I gonna die willingly, I'm gonna raise myself willingly. I mean, anybody can say, I'll die for you. Like, that's pretty noble. Like, I'll die for you. What if I said, I'll die for you, and then I'm going to raise myself from the dead? I mean, right then, you should just slap me on the face super hard. Like, knock it off, Luke. That's just crazy talk. 
Jesus is the only person who can say, I'll die for you, but I'll also raise myself up from you. Jehovah's Witnesses, others who will not look at this verse for what it says, Jesus is saying, I'm going to raise myself. I'm going to do it myself. That's where the power's at because I am indeed God, and he's making it clear at least to those who have eyes and, uh, to see and ears to hear. And uh, I would say this too. Uh, Jesus is able to be the door to heaven because he lays his life down. And he's able to be the shepherd because he takes his life up again. Do you see the correlation? Okay. How are you going to get into heaven? Jesus is like, I'll die for you. Awesome. Well, how am I going to get through life? Jesus is like, I'll be your shepherd. It's, it's perfect. Jesus is perfect. He's not making stuff up. He's not just filling in gaps. He's not just having arguments to argue. He is preaching the truth so we would know that he is the door into heaven. He's the shepherd through this life where we need a shepherd. Oh, Lord, we need a shepherd. And uh, Jesus makes it clear that that's indeed who he is. Notice the reaction. Okay, like I said, the sun hardens clay and softens ice. Just, the, sun doesn't, the sun just shines. Those are two different reactions. Here's their reaction. Therefore, there was a division again. This isn't the first time among the Jews because of these sayings. And many of them said he has a demon and is mad. Now, why do you listen to him? And uh, we've, this, is, this has come up just about every week for like the past year. Uh, Christianity is divisive. Jesus is divisive. Doesn't mean you have to be. Okay, don't be a divisive jerk, please. Christianity is. Jesus is. Just, just, that's just the way it is. It strikes people the wrong way. And as I said earlier, if the cat's getting rubbed the wrong way from some of the statements that Jesus makes, just turn the cat around. Just turn the cat around and the cat will be just fine. You've got to change your thinking into what Jesus says is true. These guys are angry and they're ticked about it. Some of you guys have come into this maybe with friends or family that look at you and say, really, you're that serious about Jesus? You're getting that. You're, why do you go to church so much? I talked to a lady after, after a second service last week, and she said that uh, one of her close, close, close family members just keeps looking at her saying, why are you going to church so much? What's wrong with you? Why are you going to church so much? This is a real close loved one of hers, and, you know, like people get offended. You know, why is Jesus so important to you? Can he, can he just be like a small file in your file folder? Why does he have to take up the whole desk and the whole den and your whole house? Does he? Is he I mean, he's polarizing. We see it right here. So if you've experienced that in your life, you're, you're not the first. And then logic comes in. Look at verse 21. Some people are super mad. And then logic comes in and says, uh, these aren't the words of one who has a demon. Uh, can a demon open the eyes of the blind? And logic comes in and says, you know, are you even listening to him? Have you even thought about what he's saying? Like, it's pretty, it's pretty crazy. Like, it's deep. It's radical. Definitely I'm getting rub rubbed the wrong way. Like, it's going against all my flesh and all my pride and all my religion and all my good deeds and everything I've ever thought. That, that sounds pretty hard. Uh, but he, he's, I don't know, he's healing people. And I think that's kind of like one strike for him. Okay? And the way he's speaking with authority, you remember the rabbis taught in those days, the rabbis would speak and teach what another rabbi had taught and spoke. No one would ever speak on their own authority. That was the culture. Jesus stands up and says, here's what I say to you. Well, I just hope you use your logical mind today and say, yeah, I don't have all the answers, but Je yeah, Jesus doesn't just change lives uh, unless it's real. Uh, Jesus doesn't just open the eyes of the blind. And some of you, I would say, the majority of you can say here today, yeah, I don't have all the answers, but I do know this. My life's different. Uh, Jesus has spoken into my heart, and there's things that have been changed in my life that nothing can explain except for God's kindness and God's grace. That's just it. There's no self-help book. Dr. Phil didn't come over to my house and give me a big old bear hug, and everything's fine now, and I didn't call Oprah. And... No, 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 no. God did a miracle, and there's no explanation. I have peace. I have direction, I have sight, I have strength, I have purpose, I have an agenda that is not my own, okay? I hope that's all, I hope you can say that of yourself uh, today, and uh, it's all about Jesus, that's just the bottom line. Check it out now, like I said, uh, jump ahead now, two and a half months, two and a half months later, Jesus has just got done saying, I'm the shepherd, I'm the, I'm the door, those are two of the seven I am statements, and uh, now, verse 22, it's the Feast of Dedication. And uh, he's in Jerusalem, and it was winter. Now, why does, why does John, who wrote this, remember his, his whole purpose, John's whole purpose in writing the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John was written, written very late in, in Christian history. John was in his 90s, okay? And he's like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write a Gospel. And his critics could have said, well, well, there's Matthew, there's Mark, and there's Luke. What's your problem? Just get off it. And he's like, well, no, I'm not saying those aren't good. Those are, those are great. 
But I want to make sure that people know, because there was controversy, that Jesus is God. That's the whole deal. I want to make sure they know that then they can believe, just as John chapter 20, uh, verse 31, I'm going to write that you would believe and that by believing you would have life in his name. So John's very in, emphatic in why he wrote in the details he included. And so he includes this story right here. And he says, oh yeah, it was the Feast of Dedication. It was wintertime. Why would he say that unless there was some purpose? What is the Feast of Dedication? You guys ever read that in your Old Testament Bible? Everyone say no. No, I never read that in my Old Testament Bible. Because it's not in your Old Testament Bible. The Feast of Dedication is also known as the Festival of Lights, which is also known as the celebration of Hanukkah. Okay? Jesus shows up at Hanukkah, December 25th, uh, the 25th day of Kislev, uh, there in, in Jewish tradition. And this is the celebration of the victory over Antiochus Epiphanes. 163 uh, BC, and uh, he came into Jerusalem from the Roman Syrian Empire. You guys know the story, historians, you've read it. It's not in the Bible, but it is fact. And he came in there and he took over Jerusalem. And what did he do? Remember what he did? Uh, he took uh, some pigs into the temple and he sacrificed them on their altar. And he took the blood, pig's blood, and he made all the Jewish people drink it. Uh, how, do, how do most Jewish people look at pigs? Yeah, it's not too, not too cool. And so that was really, really bad. And so what that did is that really angered the Maccabeans, uh, these brothers and fathers and these dudes. And they said, that's too far, dude. That's too far. And they got all fired up and they banded together and there was this revolt. And they went in and they drove Antiochus Epiphanes out of the temple, 163 BC. And uh, they took back the temple. But it was in disarray, was it not? And it had been defiled. They were, they were really disappointed. And so what they did, here's the story. They cleansed the temple. They, re they redeemed it. They cleansed it, and then there was this rededication. There was redemption and rededication, and they rededicated the temple, and the rededication process took eight days, and so what they needed was eight little quarts of oil to light one each day. You guys know the menorah? You know how that works? You light it each day? Okay, same thing. And they needed eight of them in order to do this, but they only had one. They only had one. And so what they did, they, by faith, and it would take eight days to make uh, purified oil in that process, and so what they did, they said, let's just light the one, and let's start it out. What if it goes out? If it goes out, then the whole thing is ruined, according to their law. We have no choice. Okay, we got to do it today. So they lit the candle, lit the oil, and it burned not one day, not two days, not three, not four, not five. All eight days, this one thing of oil burned. They rededicated the temple. Now, I like those words, rededicated, uh, or, or should I say, a dedication to the Lord, and also provision from the Lord. And so why would John put this in here? Why would John uh, tell us what's going on? I would say there's two things that Jesus offers to you and I as he comes into our temple. I hope you're, hope you're paying attention. Now we're done with the history lesson. Now I'll make application. When Jesus comes into our temple, like, like when we need to be cleansed, he offers to us both redemption because we've been defiled. Things have gone crazy. Anybody would say that your temple inside is just kind of crazy. Some things have been done in there that's just uh, maybe even recently. <laughs> Well, the Lord offers redemption. The Lord offers redemption. And then you say, what about the long term? How am I going to walk through this? And God, through that symbolism of that light, he offers provision. He will provide for you the light, the lamp, Jesus himself. So Jesus shows up there at Hanukkah. It's, it's, it makes sense that he's there. But I think John tells us, in order that we would make those simple applications, that Jesus Christ is indeed the light that they are celebrating. Keep, keep reading with me. Verse uh, 23, Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Uh, Solomon, of course, is the guy with the most wisdom in the world. You remember his story. And uh, he had uh, one wish given to him. And instead of asking for all the riches... Instead of asking for all the power, instead of asking for all the wealth, instead of asking for all that, he said, God, you know what? Your kingdom's pretty big. Would you give me enough wisdom to lead them well? And God was mind blown. He's like, are you for real? <sighs> Thank you. I'm going to give you the most wisdom ever and the most wealth and the most provision and the most victory. I'm going to give you everything. And uh, so this is a, de a porch dedicated to Solomon and uh, the man of wisdom. Verse 24, then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, how long do you keep us in doubt? If you're the Christ, tell us uh, plainly. Uh, do you guys see what's going on here? They literally surrounded him. I mean, if we could have a video of this, uh, they just, all these guys in big hats and big jackets, and they're in charge, and they literally surround him like gang members, like, all right, dude, it's over now. We got you. You're here at the temple. You've been gone for a little bit, hiding out in the Jordan River area. Uh, now we got you. We're surrounded. And what they're asking for him to do is to tell them plainly, or that word could be translated publicly. They're saying to Jesus, say it again. Say it again. Say it to my face. Say it to my face, Jesus. 
And what their point is, is they're saying, look, we got all the big guys here, all the big shots, all the guys in jackets and hats. If you say what you said earlier, in my opinion, this is what they're drawing him into this public confession. Now we can do you in. Let's read it a different way. Let's, let's be positive for a second, okay? Let's just be positive. Uh, here's what it says. Uh, verse 24, then the Jews surrounded him. And they said to him, how long do you keep us in doubt? If you're the Christ, please tell us plainly. We want to know so bad. That's, that would be cool. Wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't that be cool if they just rushed Jesus and they just had their connect cards ready to fill out? We want to just be a Christian. We want to follow you. Where do we sign up? Just tell us, tell us, tell us. There are people with legitimate questions that want legitimate answers. Those are awesome. Okay? Critics, doubters that just need answers. Fun stuff good debates, good conversations. I would encourage you, find those people, go there with them, disciple them, buy them a cup of coffee. Then there are others who say, hey, I've got a great question for you that's going to make you look like an idiot and make me look like the one in charge, and then I'll be able to kill you. Uh, let's talk. And you're like, uh, okay. Should we do it openly on Facebook? You know, is that what you're talking about? And they're like, please, I want to. And I've had that on my wall thousands of times, people asking questions on my wall for no desire to get closer to God, no desire to know him, no desire to serve him, but only all they want to do is argue and fight. Beware of that. These guys are drawing Jesus into this debate. That's what's going on here. They want a public uh, debate in order that they could do what they want to, to do to him. And we know that, by the way, by the reaction in verse 31. We'll get there in a little bit. Now, uh, if I was Jesus and I had this request come to me because we've been studying John, we know how clear, has Jesus been clear up until this point, uh, who he is? Real clear. There is, there, I don't know. I mean, John didn't write this book to be unclear. He said, I'm going to write, write it out because I want it to be real clear. I'm going to give you all the highlights of when Jesus was like super duper uber clear about this. And so if I was Jesus and uh, they said, hey, just tell us uh, plainly. Oh, pl oh, plainly. Oh, Oh, right. Uh, plainly. Uh, yeah, I forgot. You mean, oh, kind of like in uh, John 8, 12. You can turn back there. I'll just read it to you. Kind of like in John 8, 12, uh, where I said, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Like that kind of plainly. Or maybe he would go back even, even further to John uh, 7, 38, and, and he, he might say this to them. Uh, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow liver, rivers, livers, uh, rivers of living water. Uh, or maybe Jesus would get even more sarcastic. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe not. I, I know I would, and I'm not Jesus at all. And uh, maybe he would say this, and uh, maybe, oh, maybe like that one time when I fed everyone uh, in the wilderness, and I said, I'm the bread of life. And uh, they were speaking about Moses and what he gave. And I, I am that bread of life. And maybe, that, maybe that's the plainly you're talking about. Or uh, maybe in uh, John 5, uh, verses 39 and 40, uh, this is a good one, where Jesus said, hey, guys, you're looking into the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they uh, that testify of me. You're reading the Old Testament, trying to find life, and guess what? It's all about me. You know? is that the, was that the plain you're talking about? And that's just a couple. Okay, Jesus was emphatic about who he was, and uh, he had told them over and over and over, and here's the deal. This is where we do the self-examination. They weren't listening. They weren't part of the team. They weren't authentic. They were counterfeits. Understand? This is where it gets serious. This is where it gets, uh, where they are. Motives come up. Uh, Jesus replies, look at his answer. He said, I told you. I already told you. Luke just read those verses. That's like five of them. There's like 50. I already told you the answer to your question. And you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe. Because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. Now, I've said this a hundred times. I'll say it a hundred more. Uh, it's not for lack of evidence. It's not for lack of evidence that people don't believe in God or the message of Jesus Christ. It, people say it is. Well, if, I, if you could just prove it. No, that doesn't count. It has been proven. You don't believe it. Well, if you could just document it. The Bible and all of its artifacts is more documented than any other ancient literature that we have known to man. It is more proven. It is more tested. It has been more scrutinized and lasted longer. It's not for lack of evidence that people say, I don't want to be a Christian. I don't want to hear your message. That is not the reason. The reason is I don't believe. Now, here's the reason why people don't believe. 
Paul would identify this when he wrote to the Corinthians. He said, to people who believe is the power of God, the message. But to those who don't believe, those who are perishing, the message of the cross is what? It's foolishness. I don't like that message. It's foolishness. You know what it really does? The message of the cross is it takes your pride and turns it upside down. It takes your efforts and it bankrupts them. It takes everything you are and it says, no. And our pride, my pride says, you know, I kind of want to bring a little bit to the table. I thought this was kind of like a me and Jesus high five alley-oop, you know, and we're kind of doing this together. It's like, no, you're like the mascot at best on the team, okay? Jesus is, he's the star. You're like not even the water boy. Like, you're the ticket guy. That's it. You know, you're at home watching. You're a fan. That's it. It's all about Jesus, and that is offensive. Uh, Jesus goes on to say something even more um, scary, though. Uh, He says, I've told you, those are his words, and I've shown you, those are his works, okay? What, are, what kind of works did Jesus do? I just gave you a few words we just talked about. And, and then what about when Jesus walked on water? He's like, oh, was that, was that not enough? The whole walking on water thing? Like, that was pretty, pretty, you know, uh, what's the word? That was the cutting edge. No one's done that before, you know, and Peter did it too, but no one's done that before. What about the time I fed 20,000 people and just had a cafeteria lying out of a basket of food? Was that, was that not enough uh, to show you guys and and i've taught you and i've showed you what about the blind they they see and the the lame walk and the deaf hear and the the lost are found and uh my works aren't enough my word is not enough if his listen if his word what he's declared just the teaching the teaching the teaching the word of god is not enough and the works that he's done proven testified seen experienced both biblically and personally, we have people who've been healed in this church, people who've been set free in this church, people who now see in this church. If the word and the works have no effect on you, Jesus says, you're not my sheep. You're, not, you're, just, you're just not. Now, we're, we're going to see three theological points that come up in today's scriptures um, that you need to just at least know. Okay, the first one is God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty is that God is sovereign over every single thing. He's in control of who gets saved and who doesn't get saved. And he's the mastermind behind that process even. He's the one. It's all about him. Salvation, listen, is of the Lord. It's of the Lord. It's not of us. It's not something we do. Uh, There's an opposite uh, theology uh, that teaches man's responsibility. How many of you guys have heard of that? Man's responsibility. It's up to me uh, to do it. It's up to me to respond to the Lord. That's the right order. We respond to the Lord with our human responsibility. Now, some camps say that these uh, tensions are, uh, or these truths are in too great of a tension and you need to pick one and neglect the other, okay? I would say this. Your mind, my mind, finite thinkers that we are humans, uh, either God's in control or I'm in control. It's either one or the other. Well, that's because your brain's about as big as a tennis ball. If God were to give you a brain big enough to understand the fact that he's in control and that we must make a decision and that those two go together, if you could fully understand it, your head would be about as big as the bridge. And let's just be honest. How gross would that be? Okay? So God's like, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to state truth, and I'm not going to explain it. But it's true. God knows who will be saved. And here's the, here's the bummer true bummer. I hope you you get this. Not all, actually we all know this, not all people are going to go to heaven. Wow. Do you think God knew that when he created everything? Do you think God knew that when he sent his son to die for the sins of the whole world? Yeah, he did. Okay, but he did it anyways. And now he gives to us his Holy Spirit as a messenger, his word of God as a messenger, his church as a messenger, and everyone is shouting out, get saved, repent, get on the boat and there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people it's just the reality that will say i don't believe your word i don't believe your works thank you very much and their human responsibility is going to be what damns them okay your human responsibility based on your response to jesus's effort is going to be what saves you now did you save yourself no jesus saved you he did it first. So these two truths come up here, and Jesus is, I think, identifying a deeper problem. He's saying, I've told you, and I've shown you. Now, let me just say it this way. From God's point of view, this is how God looks, he would say this, you believe. You believe, 
if you're a believer here, here's why you believe. Because, because you're a sheep. God made you that way. Now, from man's point of view, you're a sheep because you believe. That's the way it works for you and me. I, 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 I believe, therefore I'm a sheep. Jesus says, no, no, you're a sheep. That's why you believe. That's just the way it is. That's God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. And uh, I'll do it in the negative sense. You don't believe. You're not a believer because you are not a sheep. There are, there are people in the world, they're called goats. Jesus said it. They're not, good, they're not believers. They're not going to get on board. They're not going to repent. And uh, the, the man's point of view would put it this way. You're not a sheep because you, you, don't, you don't believe. How many people have you talked to, blue in the face, and you're like, just believe, just believe. Just, as soon as you believe, you'll become a sheep. As soon as you believe, you'll be one of his own. As soon as you just believe, and they're like, I don't believe. And God will say, yeah, they're not a sheep. Here's the, here's the uh, practical application. How do you know the difference? Everyone say, we don't. Say it. We don't. We don't know the difference. We don't know the difference. We are called to go into the highways, into the byways, to the uttermost, to the guttermost, and preach the gospel. And all men everywhere are called to repentance. The book of Acts says all men everywhere are called to repentance. Uh, Jesus said in John 3, he said, whosoever believes in me. W what part of the whosoever uh, does that ex ex uh, discriminate against? The who whosoever, everybody. Well, how do you know if you're a sheep? I don't know. Believe, okay? Act like a sheep, okay? Uh, follow your shepherd. And uh, Jesus here, though, I believe is drawing out this doctrine of God's sovereignty. And uh, he says, uh, verse 25 again, I told you and you don't believe. The works I do, yeah, uh, they bear witness of me, but you don't believe because you're not of my sheep as I said to you. Then he gets some clarification. Here's where the self-exam really gets heavy. Verse 27, check this out. My sheep, everyone make a sheep sound. <laughs> ah, all right, we got some, got some sheep here today. That's good stuff. And uh, my sheep, here's the earmarks. Here's the check marks. You guys are doing a checklist. You're in front of the Dr. Bible now. And uh, here's what it says. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life. They shall never perish Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Stop right there and let's go through this quickly. Uh, first, earmark. By the way, that word earmark, you've heard that before. Sometimes you write an uh, earmark on your check. An earmark is an agricultural term that how you mark sheep. You look on that sheep and on that hillside, you're like, look at all those earmarks on those cows or sheep or oxen or whatever, and you know who owns them. So here's some earmarks to know if you're owned by the shepherd or if you're out there just doing your own thing and uh, making your own decisions and you're... Uh, responsibility of man is going to take you somewhere you don't want to go. And uh, here's the earmarks. The first one is, is you hear his voice. Straight up. When the word is spoken, you understand. When the word is spoken, it rings true, and you're knower. Everyone has a knower. And if your knower's not on today, I pray in Jesus' name it would be turned on. And that God would speak to your heart. You don't know all the answers, neither do I. But you do know his voice. You know his voice. And, he listen, and you listen to him, and you hear his word, and you hear, and you sense his presence. And amongst other Christians, you understand that they're with him, and you're together. Do you hear his voice? That's just a question. Now, again, some of you are thinking, man, I don't know if I do. I don't know if I do. Listen, your knower will know. I'm not calling you to be perfect. I'm not calling you to be a scholar or memorize all the Old Testament books of the Bible and open up to Zephaniah chapter 3 right now. I'm not going to do that to you. You'll, you should know. Do you hear his voice? Or, or you don't. You straight up don't. It's foreign. It's gibberish. There's nothing that God has to offer to you, and you don't hear his voice. Uh, secondly, he says this in verse uh, 28, I, uh, verse 27, actually. Uh, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them. Okay, another earmark of being a sheep is that God knows you. God, God knows you. And let me just put it this simply, because this is going to be applicationally fun. Uh, I've got a lot of friends, I've got a lot of acquaintances, and I've got a lot of familiar faces in my life. That's just the way it is. Um, and uh, I'll just use my friends as an example. My friends I know, but only to the point where I've had conversations with them and they volunteered information about them. Hello? My friends, the ones who volunteer information about them, now I know them. When they are proactive in our relationship and they volunteer or I ask them, 
And now I know them. I know that person. Well, I, I don't really know that person that well. Jesus is saying, my sheep, I know them because they are volunteering their information to me. They're talking with me. Okay, this is called prayer. It's called dialogue. Uh, it's called meditation. It's called uh, musing. And I would just say an earmark of a healthy sheep is somebody who tells the Lord what you're going through and how you feel. Let him in on your secrets because guess what? They're not secrets to him. You know, let him, let him in on your problems because he's the problem solver. Let him in on your fears because he's the fear resolver. He knows what you need. As a matter of fact, the Bible says about him knowing you, this is great. Uh, he says that he knows the hairs of your head. For some of you, that's like seven, so it's not that impressive. And uh, <laughs> others of you, it's a lot of hair. That's okay. And uh, he knows the hairs of your head. The Bible also says he takes your tears and he keeps them in a bottle. Does that sound intimate? You ever cried and just thought you were all alone? Or maybe uh, you're a man and just wish you could cry, but it doesn't work that way that easily. Or Listen, God knows. He also says, not only does he know your hairs, he knows your tears, he also knows your days. Your days are numbered. He knows everything about you. You are intimately and wonderfully and fearfully knit in the womb. He knows you. Now, check this out. If you're a sheep, that's good news. Right now, the Spirit's talking to you saying, I know, I know, I know your pain. I know, I got you. I know you. I love you. I'm your shepherd. I'm the door, man. Don't be so freaked out about life. I know you. Uh, you hear my voice. A couple other things that he says here. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Uh-oh. Earmark of a sheep. You follow Jesus. Did you know that following Jesus uh, isn't a stance that you take, but it's an action that you make? Okay, you might say, I follow Jesus. Come to my house. I'll show you my refrigerator, and on it I've got uh, verses. I've got verses on my fridge. I've got verses on my car. I've got verses on my sweatshirt, you know, it's like, cool. <laughs> it's not a declaration, I follow Jesus, it's an action. Wow, you truly follow him, you're going after him. My, we talked about this, the sheep know the voice of God, their shepherd, when the shepherd makes the sound, the other sheep that don't know it, they don't follow him, they're not going with him, they're staying with their own shepherd. You, if you're a sheep, you will follow him, and I'll just use this, uh, I got these insights from uh, another pastor, and he said, that if, if you're following, it's not going to be fake. It's not going to be convenient. You know, it's not going to be when it's easy. It's not going to be just speaking Christianese and when it's fun. If you're truly a follower of Jesus, it's not going to be fake all the time and, and, and whenever it's comfortable. Uh, if you follow Jesus, it's not going to be a feeling. Don't you love the warm fuzzies of the Holy Spirit when it's just fun and the Lord speaks to you? Guess what? Uh, if you're, it, it, don't just follow, please, with me. Band together against your flesh. Follow him at all times, uh, not just when it's uh, fun. And uh, follow him that also means not fraction or partial. Uh, yep, I go, to, I go to church on Sundays. Yep, Sundays for sure on Easter. It's twice on Easter sometimes. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, Valentine's Day, you know, whatever. You know, it's Christmas. I want presents. This is not partial. Following him. Jesus is saying to these guys who are saying, tell us plainly so we know. He's like, look, you don't believe. You're not even a sheep. You can't believe. Whoa, you okay with that? That's theology. You can't believe. You're not a sheep. And then he gives the earmarks. They hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. And I give them eternal life, verse 28, uh, and they shall never perish. Another earmark is of a, a Christian, a true Christian, a sheep. You're living your eternal life right now. When does eternal life begin? She just said, at salvation. You could mistakenly say this. I hope you uh, correct your thinking if you were like this. Eternal life, you could say, starts when I die. I can see that. Listen, eternal life started when you live. Okay, when you were born again. Eternal life began right then. And I would just encourage you, if you're a sheep, if you're a Christian, I hope you're living eternally right now. I hope you're just not getting all spent out of shape and all messed up and all whatever about life because you're living eternally. He goes on to say, no one, uh, they shall not perish. Uh, true sheep never die. You're not going to die. I mean, that's good news for most of us. That's good news. Come what may, I'm not going to die. They'll never perish, verse 28 again. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Verse 29, my father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. This idea of snatching out of your hand reminded me of a time I was in Honduras in Tegucigalpa, and uh, I was there with Crystal. Uh, she wasn't my wife at the time or even my girlfriend. We were just on a walk, and I was trying to get to know her a little better. Ha-ha. <laughs> Anyways, and uh, we were walking in the city. And uh, I remember we were just walking. It was the end of our mission trip. She was flying out the next morning, and I was staying in Honduras for another couple of weeks. And 
And uh, we were just in a busy city, and we'd been warned about everything that goes on down there, and, you know, in the city, and, you know, third world. And all of a sudden, this woman was walking in the marketplace, just walking normally with her purse kind of like dangling a little light. And this guy comes running up out of nowhere and just snatches it from her as fast as he could and took off running. And I literally thought I was in a movie, like, like just the way it all played out right there in front of me. And everyone kind of just watched him run away and went back to their business. She went running down her big old high heels, you know, chasing him, screaming in some Honduran language. And it was just crazy. This guy snatched the purse out of her hands. And took off. And that's the imagery here uh, Jesus is saying is, is that if you're a sheep, no one can snatch you out of my father's hands. Now, this is another, the third doctrine that we're getting into today. This is the doctrine of eternal security. Okay? This is the doctrine that teaches that if you are saved, that's the question, that's the bigger question. If you are saved, you're always saved. Okay? Once saved, always saved. And here's the easiest way for you to believe that because there's a lot of people here come on the Arminian side that have, were taught a different story that you can lose your salvation and that it's up to you. And I don't believe that at all. I don't believe that's biblical. I think there's some obscure verses that you could uh, maybe uh, isolate and concentrate on and then lead yourself to believe that. But this one comes from Jesus and it's pretty clear. He says, look, if you're my sheep, hear my voice. I, I know you. Uh, you'll never perish. You'll have eternal life. No one can snatch you from my hands. No one can snatch you from the Father's hands. We're doing this together. That's eternal security there. And here's the question you have to ask yourself. If you got saved by doing good works, if that's how you got saved, then you can definitely be unsaved by doing bad works. But guess what? You're not saved by doing good works. No one is saved by doing good works. It is a gift of God, lest anyone should boast. You were saved not by doing good works. Jesus did a good work, and you believed it, and that's how you were saved. It was a gift given to you. Now, if you blow it after that, guess what? You blew it before that, okay? You didn't deserve it or earn it the first time, and you can't bankrupt yourself from doing stupid stuff. Now, doing stupid stuff will get you your own problems, okay? Headaches galore. Sin is a horrible taskmaster, okay? You will find yourself uh, <laughs> wishing you hadn't have done that, okay? But your salvation, and I need some of you, some of you wrestle with this. I hope you don't. Some of you wrestle with this. Your salvation is secure if it is indeed from Jesus. He wouldn't say this otherwise. This is eternal security coming out strong, and I hope you believe that about your Savior. If not, man, uh, you're probably stressing out even right this minute. Uh, Here's a, here's a list. I'm almost out of time. I'm, I want to go through this list, though, because we're talking about self-examination. If you're saved, we'll do, we'll do some audience participation. Uh, what's changed in your life if you're saved? Someone just raise your hand. Oh, just, what's saved? Or, I mean, what's changed? Your want-tos. We're going to call those desires. Holy smokes. Your desires have changed. George? Your outlook on life. Your outlook on life. Your view. You're saved. Like, oh, man, it all makes sense now. It all makes sense now. What else has changed? Denise? Relationships. Your relationships. Okay? There's, now there's health and growth, forgiveness, forbearance. What else has changed? Hope. Your hope? <sighs> this world is hopeless. Okay? Thankfulness. Thankfulness. <sighs> You're just grateful. What else has changed? Love for others. Yeah, it, I've got a couple written down. If you're saved, uh, you get new desires. Here's the biggie. If, if you're saved, you're forgiven. We're going to look at the opposite in just a second. You're forgiven and uh, you're accepted. If you're, if you're uh, saved, you've been equipped with gifts. And uh, you have freedom. And you actually have victory, the Bible says, Romans 6, over sin. You don't have to sin anymore. We all do. We make that decision. We willingly make that decision. But the power has been broken. Romans 6 says we don't have to. The rest of the world doesn't even have that option. And uh, that's if you've been saved. Now, what if you're not saved? I'll just tell you. If you're not saved, the biggie, you're not forgiven. We'll talk about that next week on Easter Sunday. And a lot of people are mis mis uh, misinformed and thinking, forgiven of what? I forgave myself. I'm at peace with myself. Oh, cool. I'm at peace. Oh, that's great. Great. Was God at peace with you? Um, if you're not saved, you're not forgiven, you're not free, you're not accepted. Um, check this out. If you're not saved, wrath abides on you. Romans chapter 5. That's heavy duty. The wrath of God abides on non-believers. Why? Because they're not forgiven. 
Well, that sounds so crazy. I just get forgiven? Yeah, but it wasn't that, cra- wasn't that cheap. Okay? You get forgiven because of Jesus' righteousness, because of Jesus' death, because of Jesus' victory. That's where forgiveness comes from. It's all back to the hero. I just get the bank account balance transferred into my name. The, the Bible uses a big word called imputed. Okay? His glories and his riches. And uh, not only that, uh, if you're not saved, you're not forgiven, you're not free, you're not accepted, wrath abides, you are empty. And check this out, uh, worst, uh, you have hell to look forward to. Wow, that's hardcore. I'd say uh, get earmarked today and let Jesus uh, be what defines you. We've got a few more verses. I've got to finish this up. And um, look at the answer he gives. Verse 30, they ask him a simple question. Tell us plainly, Jesus. Don't keep us in suspense any longer. They're really just tricking him. And so he finally answers after giving a little bit of uh, other words here. He says, I and the Father are one. Okay. Can you deal with that? I and the Father are one. We are one. Now, I, I did a lot of reading on that. I don't even really understand or, or know how to teach it that well, except just to say it as it is. Um, but he can only say this. You guys know the Trinity is God the Son and God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, and they are one, okay? Uh, one plus one plus one equals one, okay? Uh, and it doesn't make sense because, you're, again, your brain's about as big as a tennis ball, and we need to be as big as the bridge to get this, uh, at least in the way that it is. We just accept it and say, okay, okay. Uh, it, they, are, they are one, and uh, they are different, but they are one. Look at verse 31. They're one in mission, they're one in essence, they're one in uh, philosophy, and they're one in their godness. Do you know that? If I was to uh, stand next to Chip here, I'd say, look, me and Chip, we're human. We're both human. We're all human. God's, God's not human. He's God, okay? And, and there's three in one, and they're, they're one in that sense. And he can only compare himself to somebody who's like him, which is the Father, and he's both God and man. Look at verse 31. Then they, uh, Jews, took up stones again uh, to throw at him. Uh, do you think they, uh, a lot of people say Jesus never claimed to be God. He never, oh, he never. The Jehovah's Witnesses are on a, a big mission trip right now. They're going door to door. They've really got a big, big thing. I think it's later tonight, and they want everyone to go to their house and everyone to go to their, their, their thing, and they'll say Jesus never really claimed to be God. Here, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. I don't really know what else he'd be meaning. And uh, those who had better insight than me and you who were there, those who knew the context, got real mad at what he said and tried to kill him for it. So I think they knew, and I think we could learn he indeed uh, uh, meant to say what he said. Now look at his um, reaction. Jesus is the master of all masters, and he's brilliant right here. So they're about to kill him. Instead of running, uh, Jesus says, hey, hey, hey. Uh, many good works I've shown you from my father, verse 32. Uh, for which of those do you stone me? He's kind of just showing them again logically like, oh, really that mad, huh? Which, which good work are you stoning me for? Was it the blind man? I know that was offensive. Was it the lame man? I know that was offensive. Was it forgiving the woman caught in adultery? I know that was offensive. Was it bringing all the wine to that wedding? I know that was offensive. He's like kind of putting it on them and making them look like fools. We're going to kill you, you worker of good works. <laughs> oh, Wow. Wow. And uh, Jesus is saying, uh, they, they answer. Uh, the Jews answered, say, no, it's, it's for a good work we don't stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself God. Uh, by the way, the world today, the humanistic world we live in, loves what Christianity offers as far as works. We're not stoning for a good work. We're stoning because you're being all crazy and divisive and saying funny stuff. See, Christianity... Without the gospel, it's called social gospel. Let's just, let's just fix people. Let's, let's take water to the places that don't have water. Does that sound like a good idea? And the world says, just don't bring Jesus in. Come on, come on. Heal our nations. Feed us. Do all this great stuff. Clothe us. And that's all good. When you leave the gospel out of it, then it's not offensive anymore. And the world says, yeah, we'll take it. Watch out for that. Watch out for that. Uh, Jesus saying, no, no, I do good works. And I tell you this truth straight up. Fire hydrant to your face. It's coming out. Take a drink. Uh, he throws them a curveball. Now, by the way, when they say, this is so key for your argument uh, that you have with a person who's trying to become a believer, when, when they say, we're stoning you not because you did a bunch of good works, but because you say you're God. Right then, if Jesus wasn't trying to be God, he could have just backed off and said, oh, are you for real? You thought? I, what? No, dude, it's for real. I am just like this dude. I mean, he would have backed off, clarified, cleaned up, recanted so fast, so fast. That's not what he did at all. 
He throws him another curveball. Jesus answered them and he said, well, dudes, uh, is it not written in your law? This is a quote from Psalm 82. I said, you are God's. And uh, if he called them gods in Psalm 82, to whom the word God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, uh, do you say of him who the Father sanctified and sent into the world, uh, you're blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God. Now, that's a curveball. What he's saying is using their Bible that they worshiped above all else. He's saying, remember in Psalm 82 when that word Elohim was used about the judges who were there sent to give sentence over mankind? He said, well, now I'm here, and I'm doing the same thing, and I'm kind of using a different word. It's capital G instead of lowercase g, and you guys didn't freak out then, and now what, what if God is sending me, and I'm God? Are you okay with that? Is what he's saying. Verse 37, he clarifies and makes a distinction between the guys in Psalm 82. He says, if I do not do the works of my Father, well, then don't believe me. Straight up. Like if I'm a charlatan, if this snake oil didn't work, if that blind guy is now back on the streets begging, if that lame guy is back at the... The pool sitting there, if that woman returned into sin, if, if, if this isn't working, well, dude, by all means, torch me. Like, let's do this. Turn me upside down right now. But, verse 38, don't believe the works. I'll read it again. If I, if I do, but if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Now, just a minute ago, Jesus said, you're not even my sheep. Now he just said, dudes, just believe. I mean, is this God's sovereignty or man's responsibility? It's both. We don't know. You must believe. You have to become a believer. Last three verses. Therefore, they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. Two things about the deity of Christ. The fact they tried to kill him, uh, tried to kill him shows that he was deity. The fact they couldn't kill him shows that he was deity. I mean, you're surrounded by a bunch of guys like in their environment and you just slip out. It's because you're in charge. <laughs> it's because you're in charge. And uh, I just love that. Verse 40, and he went away uh, beyond the Jordan to the place where John was baptizing at first. So there he stayed. And uh, many came to him and they said, John, the Baptist, performed no sign, but all the things that John spoke about this man were true and many believed in him. I'm going to have Paul come up in the worship team and uh, the communion elements be brought out. Uh, right now, we're going to respond, but this last verse, I want, to, want your attention to be pointed out to you, verse 41. Um, verse 41, it says, many came to Jesus, and here was their, their response to Jesus. They said, John the Baptist, his cousin, he didn't even do anything great. You guys know that? John the Baptist was just a dude, just a preacher, never did any cool miracles. All he did, all he did listen, all John the Baptist ever did, all John the Baptist ever did, besides baptize a bunch of people, all John the Baptist ever did was point to Jesus and say, that's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he goes down in history as the greatest prophet to ever live. Do you know that? Jesus said there's no other greater prophet than John. Didn't do any miracles. Didn't feed anybody. Didn't walk on water. He just, he just pointed at Jesus and said, it's him. 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 I don't know how, if, if you want to be great or not. I hope you do. I hope you have this, have, have this desire inside you to be great. It's probably being met in a bunch of different weird ways, and you're probably doing stuff you shouldn't do, trying to be great. You should be great for the kingdom of God by just telling people about Jesus, telling people about Jesus. Here, these guys show up. They say, John never did anything great, but he did tell us about Jesus, and everything he said about Jesus is now true, and I just want you to end on that thought. If you're a sheep and you want to please the Lord, be a servant, okay? Lay down your life. Tell people about Jesus. But I've never done anything great. Cool. Join the club. Join the club. I'm the president. And that uh, we just tell people about Jesus. Beard, beard club for men. No, I'm just kidding. Let's all stand. Let's all stand now and respond. The way we respond here at the church uh, to God's preaching is we take communion, we worship, and we give our tithe and offering. And uh, you can do all that on your own. Okay, we're not going to pass any hats. We don't do anything like that. And uh, you come up, you get your communion down the center aisle, go back to your chair, go outside. It's sunny today. And worship the Lord as a sheep. Just sit at the shepherd's feet. Go back to your chair. Just sit down. <laughs> I don't even know what to say. Just let him love you. Let him know you. Respond with singing, communion, and giving. Father, I pray in Jesus' name you would receive now um, our efforts uh, to respond to your efforts to serve us. And uh, we, we just confess we are so humbled 
and we're so uh, nothing in your presence, and yet you've invited us into your presence, and so we respond, Lord, and we thank you for adopting us and for paying for us. If there's anybody here today that would say, you know what, I don't, sheesh, man, I just want to be a sheep so bad. I want to be a sheep. I want the earmarks of a sheep. I want to hear his voice. I want to follow him. I want eternal life, and I want him to know me, and I want, I want, I want to be known by him. Would you just raise your hand right now and say, yep, I want to be a sheep. I don't know if I am, and I want to be, I want to be, I want to be a sheep. And I see hands up everywhere all over the auditorium. Father, I pray in Jesus' name you would uh, indeed uh, make these the sheep of your hand and bless this time now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. On my right and left, there'll be people praying for you. If you need prayer for anything at all, please get prayer. The communion table is open right now. Come forward and go back to your chair. And all who thirst and all who are
thus far. You will be faithful uh, continually. Even in our faithlessness, your faith still remains. Uh, we love you, Jesus, and we lift up this service to you. Now may it have effect, and uh, may we go in peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Uh, God bless you guys so much. Don't forget to grab some literature on your way out. Next Sunday, pray for me. I'm going to keep the message at like 23 minutes, and then I'll be baptizing people. So it's gonna Friday. Be, gonna good be, Friday. And good Friday service as well. That'll be uh, 45 minutes. But anyways, uh, See you this Sunday, and uh, don't forget, gals, tomorrow night, men, Wednesday night, everybody, Friday night at 6, Good Friday service. Other than that, plan on getting baptized on Easter Sunday, 9 and 11. Uh, God bless you guys.